Good morning. We already did that part, so I'm not going to make you do it again. I'm from Launch Darkly. My name is Heidi Waterhouse, and that's all the introduction you get. Is it going to work? Nope. OK. There's always one, it, one thing that goes wrong, right? This talk is called Every Scar a Story, and it is about the problems of moving forward in technology because we have bad past experiences. So story time for me. I have a keloid scar on my finger because when I was 10 years old, I managed to cut myself severely using a plastic knife trying to cut a piece of ham, which, which is embarrassing. The more embarrassing scar is the one that I got when I was 15 because I was literally running with scissors, 15. Um, so those were some bad life choices that I made. And I think when we're thinking about how we remember scars, we're always going to talk about how we got them because they're a good story. They're a story written on our skin. We all have these stories, so much so that in Jaws, when the guys start comparing their shark scars, it's a, a bonding moment both for them and for us. We're like, oh yeah, okay, so I didn't get like half eaten by a shark, but it does turn out that like this one time a football player ran over me. We all have these, and we tell each other about them at work. One of the most popular styles of open spaces is the horror story. Like, let's just get together and talk about terrible things that happened at work, and this time my server's caught on fire. Organizational scars are a reasonable caution around unreasonable past events, right? We know that things are... Go away bother me. We know that things are, are caused by events and we're like, let's never do that again. Uh, it turns out you shouldn't jump out of second story buildings, even if there is snow on the ground. Pro tip. Um, <laughs> I had a very adventurous childhood. Maddie Stratton usefully compared the way that organizations react to trauma to PTSD. He says that just like people, organizations can under or overreact to stimulus that reminds them of previous trauma. And I thought that was a really interesting and useful comparison because what we're saying is we are both emotionally and mentally scarred. Scars also restrict movement. If you've ever had like a serious case of road rash that covers both your knees and also your face and your elbows because you were doing 30 miles an hour, uh, on a bike, uh, <laughs> you know that you can't bend your elbows or your knees while the scars are healing up, and you can't get up back on your bike. And by the time you could get back on your bike, that's a lot of time for you to remember how much it hurt, and not a lot of like repetition and movement. So organizations end up having these same problems. So one of the things that happens is we have these, these uh, experiences that change us. So who here remembers when the weather used to yell at you? You should remember this. It was, we stopped doing it in 2016. It used to be you would get a weather report from the National Weather Service and it'd be like, perfectly nice fall day happening here. Nothing the matter at all. Or hurricane, you're all going to die. Except this was before they actually said things like, you're all going to die. Um, that is a useful addition that came in in 2016. We figured out that it is better to tell people things in natural uh, punctuation and capitalization because they listen better. The reason the weather used to yell at you was because it came in by teletype. This was cutting edge technology when it came out, but it could really only do capitals and periods, which is why not only did the weather yell at you, it had like these long poetic Emily Dickinson style pauses. <laughs> It's like, wind from the north, 15 miles per hour, dot, dot, dot. <laughs> Pleasant conditions, dot, dot, dot. Uh, <laughs> because with a teletype, that is all the punctuation you could manage. But we've moved on, and our tools have moved on, and our ability to transmit emojis has moved on. And uh, we can now say in natural language, the weather might kill you. You should probably look out for that. So here's another one. Why do Americans use inches and pounds? Do you remember? Do you know? 
because it's too damn expensive to change. It's not like it's a good idea. Anybody who remembers being in second grade and being introduced to the metric system is like, wait, this actually makes a lot more sense. <laughs> there are 10 to the, to the unit and then, why are we using 12 and 16? This is, this is not okay, I don't understand. But because that's what we learn and because that's what our systems are set to, it would cost so much. Who here works on their car? You ever work on your car? Yeah. How many different sets of sockets do you have? Two, right? Because you need both the metric and the common measurement, and they're not interchangeable, and 13 millimeters is not the same, and it's slippy and it's not okay. It's so expensive for us to work between these two systems. Well, that's not great. Like, why are we doing that? Well, because we know that it would cost $46 billion for NASA alone to change to entirely the metric system. Although I have to say, depending on how many landers you crash on Mars because of this problem, it might pay for itself. <laughs> why do we use checklists? We use checklists because they're super useful scars. Checklists are an example of a codified representation of everything we've previously screwed up. When I was a tech writer, doing print publication. Like, so you had to send it out to a print vendor, and it was like 500 pages of, uh, like, with, with the crop markings and the, like, color. It was very complicated. I had a 58-step checklist for print production because 58 different ways to screw up had been discovered by somebody who looked a lot like me. Like, I'd forget to add the crop marks. I would not put the uh, extra uh, font files in. Like, there are a lot of ways to screw up printing, and I found a lot of them. Um, it was a complicated system. And I'm like, okay, well, every time I get this wrong and my boss yells at me, I'm gonna write an item on my checklist. And eventually my boss looked at my checklist and said, well, that's really complicated, isn't it? <laughs> mm, thanks, Seth. yeah, yeah, it is. So this is my checklist for when I'm traveling. Every one of these items represents something I have forgotten when I got on a plane. Um, <laughs> toothbrush is the least drastic of them, I think. Uh, I, I got my to-do list stolen like last month and I'm still recovering. It, it's, it's emotionally terrible because I'm like, maybe I need to replicate my to-do list in digital even though I do it on paper because it was so bad. I'm like, well, that's, that's a trauma reaction, right? Uh, there's an empty bullet for the next thing I forget because inevitably there will be something. You would think this is everything you would ever need, uh, but there will be something. You'll be like, how could you even forget that? Did you literally forget like your suitcase? How does that happen? I once saw charity majors give a talk in pajamas and a conference t-shirt because she had forgotten her dress. It was kind of impressive. So our scars are a story, right? These marks on our bodies and our organizations remind us of risk. Institutions are always reacting to the last thing. How often do you have a conversation with your boss where they're like, you know, the last time we tried that it was a disaster, right? And then how many times do you have a conversation with your boss where they're like, yeah, that sounds like a great idea, let's just go right ahead with that. We're always reacting to the last risk because it's the safest thing to do, or it feels like it. So let's talk a little bit about code history. We're gonna talk about how development method and version control and deployment are inextricably linked with each other. You cannot change one of these things without needing to change the other two. And I think that's something we haven't talked about enough. It's a really interesting problem. So, dawn of computers, I mean, not like Ada Lovelace dawn, but like ENIAC dawn, right? Um, we typed things in to systems, and it was ephemeral code. Like, when I got, and, and we did physical backups. So, when my dad bought a CPM-based machine, because my dad is an early adopter and a terrible guesser, uh, also, Betamax, Laserdisc, uh, yeah, the list goes on. Um, 
CPM based machine, he's like, no, no, IBM, too expensive, it's not gonna work. Um, he bought me, bought us a bunch of basic magazines. And the way you play a game in basic is first you type it in, and then because you are like eight, you don't actually swear because it's not working, but you think about it. You're like, if I knew bad words, I would say bad words right now because there's an error in these 400 lines somewhere, and I don't know where. That's how it worked. You just had to go back and look with your like own little eyeballs. And the way we stored programs was we printed them out in magazines or on, you know, cards or there's a couple different physical ways that we stored things, but like that was our backup. If you were super rich, you had a disk that you could copy it to. That's pretty exciting. So this is our deployment method, punch cards and printed material. That's how we got software from one person to another. We didn't have connected computers. It wasn't really a thing. All right, so time rolls on. Waterfall, shared code, IDEs, right? We're moving into the age of enterprise software. How do you keep each other from stepping on your code? Like, what happens here? Because if you have more than one person writing code, if there's more than one computer you could be typing into, there is the inevitable problem where you try and type the same thing in different places or different things in the same place. Both of these are bad. So how do you keep each other out? Well, we had some stuff like SVN, vis Visual Source Safe. I'm, I'm waiting until somebody in the audience just starts crying because this is, this is our lived experience. Um, we had ways to lock each other out of code. So when you were gonna work on a part of the code, you would check it out. And nobody else could see it or touch it. They might be able to see it, but they couldn't touch it. They couldn't change it. If, for instance, you got fired while that code was checked out, sometimes they had to like retype or copy and paste that code back in from the branch because they couldn't break the lock. Theoretically, we had lock breaking, but it, it was not reliable. So the, the version control lockout and the development method waterfall went with release method gold master. We used to burn CDs. And this is a really interesting thing because the way we thought of software was really finite. The way we thought of it was like, this is the release. Who here ever used this software? Yeah? Yeah, okay. This was the most amazing software ever. It had a word processor and a spreadsheet and a clip art library. And it came in a box that was like this big because there were 26 disks in it. And in order to install this like office suite, what you had to do was put each disk in and wait till it copied to your tiny shred of memory on your computer. And then you could run things. It was so exciting because you could copy things to your computer, you didn't have to run them from disk, and also it came in like a package, and it was literally shrink-wrapped. Like people will say dismissively shrink-wrapped, but I remember when Windows 95 came out and I'm like, this is so cool, like the packaging itself is awesome. Uh, yeah, for Lotus to write something like that, they had to use this lockout and waterfall method because there was no other way to do it. You had to plan a long ways ahead because you were going to release in six months or a year or two years, right? It wasn't like you could toss out a release at any time. It was a thing. It was an event. You got whiskey, man. It was great. Uh, and it meant that if anything went wrong with the software, you are gonna have to send people a disk. Like, that was pretty much your only recourse until 98 or so. Like, if there was something wrong with your software, if you didn't QA it properly, it was wrong. That's all there was to it. You had screwed up and it was unfixable. Moving on, the start of my career was extreme programming, which was just a little bit before we got super head about Agile. And what we decided was that maybe this whole like two years to release cycle uh, 
was not optimal. Maybe we should be able to fix things, and we had this internet, and everybody was getting on it. It was pretty great. But this whole lockout system works super poorly for distributed or for agile teams. It's terrible because you're like you're trying pair program which one of you has the lock or you're trying to do like small nimble versions and and you have this whole like who who's using SVN and there's like a turtle war and it's all really terrible but a new way of doing software source control came along and we stopped thinking of it so much as source control and we started thinking of it as like management. So Linus invented Git because it turns out that it's a pain in the ass to work on a distributed system with SVN and also it costs money for a license. So we're, we're gonna have Git and for the last 20 years or so, that's been the way we've taught how software works. Like, what do you do when you create a feature? Branch, right? The first thing, reactively, every time, every time you're gonna make a change to the code, create a branch. When you're done with the feature, what happens? Merge. What happens when you merge? Break, right? <laughs> Fights, arguments, like nerf, nerf wars, all sorts of things happen when you merge back in because you've been working invisibly parallel to each other and you can't see what other people have done. Theoretically, this works out okay because you're doing really rapid reintegration and you're pulling from master every day. That is all a lie. I don't know, like, I know everybody knows they're supposed to do that. I don't know many people who actually do that. So that's, that's kind of a problem, but okay, it works out okay for an agile team. It changed the process a lot to have this ability to not lock people out, to be able to work together in the code in the same place. It was a paradigm shift, a revolution. And it was kind of friendly. Like, anybody who has taught a newbie to use GitHub thinks that it's actually kind of easy and why don't they get it? Anybody who has ever been a newbie when you learn GitHub has been like, why, what, what is going on and I'm so confused and also there's this diagram that looks like I just played Guitar Hero really successfully. <laughs> right, but, but it works really well for Agile teams. And when we release, we can just push an update package. We can just push a patch and it's gonna be great. It's gonna work out super well for us because we have the internet and we can say, yo, Dumbass. Uh, we made a mistake like four sprints ago and we're gonna fix it this sprint and no big, right? I don't know why we call them dumbass, but that, that was on us, but we were sprinting. We were sprinting. Rapid iteration and improvement. Well, we're not going to be able to do Agile forever. Agile was a great solution for teams that were local. If you think about how Agile works, it involves a lot of low-level human communication, and it sucks when you try and do it as a distributed team. We have a bunch of workarounds. We have a bunch of stuff we're doing, but it's really hard, and it's not just the physical. Like, if you're writing a microservice, you don't actually need to pair on that. What you need to do is be able to define your endpoints. Nobody cares what's inside the box, right? All we care about is the endpoints. Can I hit your API? Can I hit your function? I don't care how you wrote it. Like, there could be, you know, scratch code inside that for all I care, as long as it's giving me a reliable uh, output, right? So, microservices, mesh networks, feature, or uh, function as a service, containers, serverless, these are not actually super good fits with Agile. Like, how many of you have experienced this? You're like, a sprint isn't the right way to describe a microservice. Like, yeah? Yeah, some of you? The way that we should do source control for this problem doesn't involve doing branching because then you can't see what anybody else is doing. If you're doing branching, you can't tell what other people are doing. The best way to do source control 
for a microservice environment is to use feature flags. Use a mono repo, do trunk-based development. I know you're tired of hearing about trunk-based development already. We've only been talking about it for like a couple years, going back to it seriously. Trunk-based development means that you never, almost never, have giant merge conflicts. I want the job release manager to be eliminated because release manager is a terrible job. It's nothing but settling interpersonal arguments all the time and also staying up late or waking up early. Like, let's not have that job anymore. Let's, instead of creating a branch, hide our stuff behind a flag because that's going to enable us to do continuous deployment. Is it really continuous deployment if you can't deploy broken code? You have to be able to deploy broken code to production in order to be doing continuous deployment. Like, sit with that for a second. You have to put broken code in production. But you don't have to show anybody, because that would be gross. I don't, I don't want to show anybody my broken code, and you don't either. So let's go ahead and hide it, because it's all really complicated when we're doing this development. We're standing at a cusp as likely to change our thinking as the Agile transformation. In a lot of ways, we're going back to our object-oriented language roots, but this time, instead of libraries, our objects are gonna be microservices, and it's not gonna matter if they're built by us or someone else. We don't care who built that. Like, I could use third-party authentication on my banking app, and I could use third-party OCR, and I could use third-party front-end, doesn't matter, it's still the banking app, right? You're still responsible for how it's all stitched together. So when we think about this, I actually think uh, package managers are the start of this new revolution because we're like, there's no reason I should have to rewrite something that someone else has already written. And if they've already written it and someone is keeping it updated, that is more efficient for me to consume than it is to build. Like this is the build versus buy argument writ large, right? Package managers. Why should I have to build even something as trivial as left pad if someone else offers it to me and I can consume it? It's kind of awesome. It's kind of terrifying because we are distributing both our risk and our, our power. And now, we need to see and understand how much it's gonna change source control. Long-lived feature branches are antithetical to this process because they can't be tested or integrated until they're visible to everyone. I want your testing to be at your individual level. I want you to be able to do your testing in production. Uh, later this month, I'm giving a talk called All the World's a Staging Server. And it is, that's because my boss made me change it from kill staging, death, death, death. Um, <laughs> but staging is a lie, because almost none of us have the money to do an all up full staging replication. And even if we did, who wants to put actual user data in their staging server and have to secure user data in two different points? But if you're not using user data, you're not really testing because users are really weird. Really weird. They have like 19 year old sprint accounts and they have like these weird modifications and they have names that are actually like these four names are all the last name or your name is two letters long or one, one letter long. Those are all valid variants, right? But if you try and generate test data, it's never gonna be as weird as user data. So the important thing to testing is make sure that you actually test it in a real environment. Staging is a lie. So long-lived feature branches, therefore, need to be tested in production. The book Accelerate by Nicole Forsgren and Jez Humble and Gene Kim is super clear. It says, the faster you go, the safer you are. The faster you go, the less risk. The faster you go, the smaller the delta, the less the risk. And that is scary. It's terrifying. I was thinking about what this is like, and if you've ever taught a kid to ride a bike, 
it is the weirdest experience. Because what you're doing is you're taking your child, who you love, and putting them on a device that could mangle them, and flinging them at the pavement. And you say, if you pedal fast enough, you won't fall down. And the kid's like, hang on a second. This does not make sense. This does not make sense to me. Why would going faster so that when I fall down, I take off more skin, why would that be a good idea? And like you know, both from learned experience and from physics, that they will be more stable when they go faster. You will be more stable when you go faster. So how can you go faster? Well, you can never freeze. You can never stop. You can keep doing not just sprints, but daily, hourly, minutely deployments. That's pretty amazing. I think that we need to change how we're thinking about the whole idea of deployment. It's not an event. Release is an event. Release is a moment in time when you're like, we're going live with this. Deployment is just a part of how you develop a code. Release is going to be progressive and incremental. Things are going to seep out. You're going to test. You're going to do beta. You're going to do a canary. You're going to do progressive deployment, like 10%, 20%. Like, why would you ever be like all off, all on? That's kind of hard on your servers, right? I mean, even if your servers are virtual, that's a bunch of load all at once. Why not ramp it up? The problem with changing is not habit. Habits are usually useful. The problem with changing is ritual. Take the famous pizza team, for example. Like, Amazon says that if you can't feed a team with two pizzas, it's too big. Well, I don't know about you, but I work remote. Nobody buys me pizzas. I don't sit with my team. I'm not having that experience. So when we say, a team shouldn't be more than eight people, that's a meaningless quantifier for me. What I need is a way to talk about teams that are distributed across time zones. Like, how do you do meetings when you're 12 hours apart? It's kind of a pain, but that's the thing we need to be talking about. We don't need to be talking about what it's like to eat pizza together. So, I was thinking about how to actually make this talk useful and not just like nerding out about computer history. And I was thinking, there are three reasons that we don't like adopting new things as organizations with SCARs. The first one is the standards problem. Uh, we really dislike having to upgrade our standards because it's painful. And the longer we put it off, the more painful it is. Um, I personally do not love the dentist. Uh, I really don't love the dentist a lot. The dentist is... Yeah, so I'll put off going and getting my cleaning. Who here knows what happens when you put off getting your cleaning for three years? Cavities. This is the same thing that happens with other organizations. We're like, I don't want to do that small pain, so I'm gonna put it off. And then eventually you get to the point where you are forced to upgrade from soap to rest. And it's a large pain, and you have no process for how to do that. The smaller the delta, the faster you go, the safer you are. Uh, businesses do not like spending money arbitrarily, it turns out. I mean, it feels like they do, but that's just because somebody super charismatic has convinced them that executives should fi fly first class and not the rest of us. Um, if there is not a perceived business need to change, no matter how much technology coolness you bring, they'll be like, ain't broke not gonna fix it, right? Word is fine, right? We've all had this argument. You're like, can we do the new thing? And they're like, no, that'd cost like a lot of money and we're fine, don't need to do it. No business need to change is a real blocker. And similarly, but not exactly the same, no perceived need to change. Uh, Henry Ford famously said that if he had asked people what they wanted, they would have wanted a better horse-pulled carriage instead of a car. The automobile was such a leap beyond what most people wanted that it was a real risk. So when we're talking about a company's perceived need to change, it's really difficult for them to think beyond a better 
force pulled carriage because they need to see not just the current benefit, but the future benefit. And that's a hard argument to make. So given those three blockers, what eventually causes companies to change? Uh, well, the first one is a standards problem because eventually it becomes so painful to have your old standards that you upgrade. Um, this, this was the age of the multiple uh, USB Lincoln. And I, these are not mine, but I literally had all of these. And I was so excited when we hit the micro USB standard where you're just like, okay, there's, there's a plug, it's a plug. I'm hoping USB-C gets there eventually, but we have, we have a ways to go yet, as evinced by everybody who's tried to use the new MacBooks. Um, there's, there's, it's, not, it's not yet a standard, but the reason that we have to stay, change is standards problems. Like, my first job out of college, before the extreme programming job, was EDI, which is Electronic Data Interchange. And uh, we used this to do, like, massive e-commerce and car parts. Like before there was even really consumer internet, there was this business to business stuff. But eventually EDI was not the standard anymore. We started using different standards. And either you moved with that and became SPS Commerce, which is the same company I started working for and now they're huge, or you didn't move with that and you got eaten. So eventually a business will see that a standards change is essential. Uh, the second problem is pain. And you remember how I said that business needs need to be like a monetary argument? Uh, pain is a monetary argument. Like we are losing money supporting this. Like we cannot sustain this AWS bill. We have to figure out how to refactor this somehow because it's just not something we can do. Our cost of goods and services is too high. So when you're thinking about how to motivate people to change, frequently pain is the reason. The most exciting one is potential. Um, and this is also the most difficult argument to make for people who have scars about uh, being laser disc adopters. Uh, my dad has never developed this scar, by the way. He's, he's a charming enthusiast. Um, but lots of companies have developed the scar where we're like, it turns out the last time I tried something new, I got burned. It was a Betamax, it was terrible, I didn't win. So I don't want to try a new thing. But the thing that we can use to convince them is also potential. If I say to you, what if, what if it were easier than branches? What if you didn't have to have 15 branches to do customization? What if you could have one trunk and flags to do your customization? And you think about how much less management effort that's going to take and how much more potential that gives you for doing new things. Well, that's pretty exciting. That's a potential argument. And those are the most exciting ones to make, but also the hardest to convince people with scars. So when you are trying to convince someone to make a change, here are the three things you need to do. Also useful for traffic, but I think, you know, we're probably past that point. First, you have to stop. You have to stop and think about what argument you are making. What is the, the effect you are trying to get? Because a lot of us are like, but shiny. I have this problem all the time. Like, do I need the new Kindle uh, uh, paper white? Maybe not, but it's waterproof. And I do read in the bathtub. Uh, so you have to like stop and figure out those arguments for and against before you try and persuade someone. And then you have to look and see what problem they are really trying to solve. The problem you're trying to solve is different than the problem someone else is trying to solve. If you don't look at the world from their point of view, you screw up. I worked for a company that did essentially scraping Medicare billing and presenting it in a friendlier UI. And you would think this would be great because if you've seen Medicare building, billing, it's a green screen, right? It's, it's on a mainframe. It's a little terrifying for anybody using modern software. The people who were doing this had never sat in a billing office at a medical, at a doctor's office. The, and it is almost like 98% little old ladies, like 60 and over. Um, they are wizards with the green screen. 
They have an entirely keyboard-based workflow. They can get through a whole bunch of, of bills all at once without ever taking their hands off the keyboard. And we were presenting them this friendly GUI that involved using a mouse. It's not like they didn't know how to use a mouse. They used it for like their time cards and stuff. But we were asking them to do something that felt extremely slow and, and stupid to them because we thought it would be easier. We had not looked at what they were doing. And then you need to listen. You need to listen for people's problems and hesitations. You need to listen to their scar stories. Because if you don't know why Quint is afraid of sharks, you don't understand how angry he is about sharks. Because this is a thing, like sharks ate his buddy. Sometimes we have to listen to people's scar stories over and over again to understand why they are being what seems to us irrational and bulky. So, if this talk was too long and you read Twitter instead, especially because it's morning, uh, development, source control, and release methods are inextricably linked. If you change one, you will end up changing the rest, even if you don't intend to. That's what I want you to take away. We are at the cusp of changing into a post-agile world driven by our need for microservices and APIs and endpoints and serverless and functions as a service. And it is going to change how we do source control and how we do deployment. And if you don't get on that train now, that's fine. But I will see you in five years or 10 years. Or even there are people who are doing agile transformation today that's going to be just a lagging indicator. And if you didn't get a free t-shirt from our booth upstairs, you can take a picture of this slide and go to the URL and we will send you a t-shirt. Thank you all for your time. If you have any questions, you can find me later. I'm the not Tiffany person with colored hair. <laughs> all right, thank you.